Welcome to episode 16 of Real Life, Real Gospel. I'm glad that you found us today. We are sponsored by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida, where I am a vicar. My name is Josh Laborious. I am Josh Laborious. I'm the host of this podcast. Um, and just in case this is your first time listening in, what I want to get at, I guess, is, is what we do. We take topics that hopefully intersect with daily life that are a reality for Christians or for most Christians, and I I seek to talk about them in touch with that reality. So I, I take passages from Scripture, and then we break them down, and we try and apply them to our lives and I, I try to pretty actively to avoid theological language and academic language because I want this to be applicable. I want this to be helpful. And as far as the topics we address, um, those are entirely by submission. So if you have a topic that you want to hear, whether you're a repeat listener or this is your first time, please comment on whatever medium you are listening in on, uh, whether that be Spotify or YouTube or Podbean or iTunes or um, Google Podcasts, let me know and I I will take those topics, which which brings me to this week's topic, which is suffering, which I think is really appropriate for the place that the world is in right now. And this topic is in a roundabout way courtesy of Keith LeCompte. Um, For those of you who don't know, he is the the worship arts leader at St. Paul, where uh, the the church that sponsors this podcast, um, and he the topic he submitted is actually the sovereignty of God, which I'm twisting ever so slightly to talk about suffering, because uh, the the core of the question is, if God is good, and God is all powerful, why is there suffering in the world? So it, it's an application of the question about the sovereignty of God. And I think it's really appropriate to be talking about in the midst of the virus, the coronavirus that is is causing so much havoc and suffering in the world that if you are listening to this near the time that it was released, you are fully aware of. And I saw a sign the other day. It was a sign on a, a church. I was driving around town. We were, uh, myself and the other pastors at the church, we were delivering Easter bags to various families in the congregation who had kids in our either in our school or in our uh, faith training program. And I saw a sign outside of a church that said, God does not cause suffering. And one of the things I'm going to get at in this episode is that that is not entirely true. So with that, that's been our introduction. We're going to move into the episode, the content of the episode. This is Real Suffering, Real Gospel. So to start us off, we're going to get into the scripture, as we always do, and we're going to start in Job, which is a fairly obvious Old Testament source to look at suffering. And I'm going to look at something from the beginning of the book and something from the end of the book. So I want to start in Job 2 verses 1 through 6. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. To present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him. With no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. All that a man has he will give for his life, but stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. And that's where I want us to start. So, for context, the the, begin, the very beginning, the first chapter of Job, we learn that Job is blessed by God, he is fruitful, he has wealth and land and animals and and family, and, and he's faithful to God, he sacrifices on a regular basis, he lives righteously, 
and God gives Satan permission to afflict Job. And, and the text we read here is, uh, Job holds fast his integrity, although Satan incite, incites God against Job to destroy Job without reason. And and this is where the book starts. And then through the through a huge portion of the book, as we continue forward, Job spends the book uh, mourning and and speaking with his friends. And his friends, frankly, give him really bad advice. Uh, at one point, even going as far as saying curse God and die. Um, and then, and then Elihu, the young buck who, who he, he introduces his speaking portion later as I didn't say anything because I was the young guy and I was giving the respect to, uh, Job's older friends, but he, he kind of speaks up and says, you guys are idiots. Who are you to question God? Um, and I, I only bring that guy up because I really love that character because it's kind of this evidence point to just because you have white hair, just because you're older, doesn't necessarily mean that you have everything figured out and you shouldn't be listening to the young people. Um, which is a tangent, but it's one of my favorite parts of Job. So so God responds. And that's where I, I want to dive into a second passage from Job, actually. And that is chapter 38, verses 1 through 7. Where the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man, I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And, and it's not just about creation. This, I, I read just the first few verses. He goes on for, God goes on for 73 verses, spread out over three chapters. On all of these things that he has done and known and been a part of, that Job has no understanding of. So that's the text we're working from today. That's the text I want to pull from today. And the, the, obvious question is what can we take away from this as listeners in 2020 uh hundreds of years removed from job uh thousands of years removed from job actually what can we take away from this uh we aren't job and we don't know we we don't know why we're suffering we don't know that satan has spoken to god and has been given permission to challenge us but that's my point we, we don't know if we can put ourselves in the exact same position as, as Job, and, and I think that's actually what God is getting at in the book of Job. Because at his core, in the 73 verses he addresses Job in this way, the core of what he's getting at is, who are we to question God? You see, we, we are, are an arrogant people. We think we're hot stuff. We think that we are owed answers and understanding, but we're not. We are nothing. We are broken, sinful people. We are creations. We are creatures. We are not the creator. We are not lords. We are not masters. We are not even assistant managers. We are nothing. God doesn't owe us any answers. And the, the reality to this is I really don't want a God who I can understand completely. Because in reality, that wouldn't be much of a God. If I could understand and, and, and control and master God, that puts me in the position of God. Because I have a greater understanding. So, and this is a, a, a common, I guess, argument that, that happens is we, we try to answer all these questions about God and people will say, well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, what about this? Eventually, we have to be willing to say, I don't know. And I think there, if we stop and actually think about what that means, I think there's some comfort in that. And I think there's just some plain reality in that, that if we believe in a God that isn't all powerful and is above us, there are going to be things about God that we don't understand. So taking all of this that we have 
and applying it to our original question, um, God is good. God is literally the definition of good. If something is good, it's because God has declared it so. So, God is good. That is something we know. God is all-powerful. Nothing is outside his control. That's what he j- he spends 73 verses in Job covering. He says, I have created all things. I am in control of all things. I am almighty. I am all-powerful. So that leaves us with the question of why does suffering exist? Because there is a reality that suffering exists. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you suffering isn't real. There are people out there who are sick, who are on ventilators, who are dying. There, even, even without the coronavirus, there are people out there who are suffering, who are starving, who are homeless. There is brokenness in the world. And, and what, I, what I'm going to tell you today that's going to be really uncomfortable for us to sit with because I, I'm not going to go too much further is that God has a reason for it. And it doesn't matter if we understand that reason, if we get it. And something I have as an example for this is parents disciplining a young child. Uh, say like a, a three or a four year old or, or maybe younger than that, they're reaching up to touch the stove and you slap their hand. Now they're not going to understand why you slapped their hand. They're going to cry. It's going to hurt. They're suffering. But you know, it was so that their suffering wouldn't be greater. Or another example, when, when a kid is older, you might ground them or take something away. And they're suffering in the midst of that, but you're disciplining them. You're, you're teaching them a lesson so that they're better off later on in life. Maybe you're building their character. Maybe you're teaching them not to do a certain thing. It's discipline. Or on the other hand, maybe they did something really dumb and say you take away their phone. Or you do ground them and it's, it's punishment. And they may not understand why. But there's still that that reality that you as a parent have a plan and you maybe have a greater understanding than they do. Now, now what's my application here is, in, in some ways, God can be like a parent. Suffering, our suffering, can be any number of things. It can be punishment. Um, after, after the attacks on 9-11, there were, there were preachers who came out and said, you know, this is because of America's sins, that God has allowed this to happen. Which I, I have a separate problem with that I'm going to get to in a second. But yes, it could be punishment. It could be punishment for all the things the citizens of the world have done wrong, is why the coronavirus has been unleashed. It could be discipline. It could be with the goal of bringing people to the gospel, bringing people to Christ. It could be accomplishing something in the world. The coronavirus it, it might have killed someone who was going to later become uh, another Hitler. And I'm not saying that's what it was, but I'm saying that could be the case. God has the foresight to know those things. Um, my, my point with all of this is there are so many reasons God could cause suffering. And we don't know which one it is, which is the problem I have with those preachers who after 9-11 said this is because America... Uh, is allowing gay marriage and is allowing abortion and is allowing all these things. And could it be? Yes. I'm not going to deny that God could be punishing America for those things, but can we declare that with any certainty? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We don't know why God is doing things. His motions, his motivations are beyond our comprehension. That is what I am driving at. We can be sure there is a reason behind any suffering he causes. But we we cannot possibly declare what it is. So there is this reality. There is this reality that there is suffering in the world and we don't have an answer for it. We don't know why God causes suffering. We don't know why he allows suffering to happen. And this makes us really uncomfortable because we want to know. We want to feel like we have some semblance of control. But my my gospel message for you in the midst of this is that God does know what he's doing. All those questions he asked Job, you know, where were you when the, the foundations of the earth were laid? Where were you when it was measured out? Where were you when all these things were happening? God was there. 
God knows what he has done and he knows what he is doing and he knows what he will continue to do in the future. So while we may not understand it, we may not be in control, we have a God that is good, that loves us, that is in control. And that is the joy, that is the gospel I have for you this morning. But kind of continuing in this idea of suffering, I want to approach our our gospel reading for this podcast, and that comes from John 16, starting at verse 31. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So some textual notes on this passage. This is right before the Passion. So it's kind of appropriate that this this podcast is going out right before we celebrate Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and Easter. Um, But he's talking about the disciples being scattered and separated. Which happens when when Jesus is arrested, the disciples run. They scatter each to their own homes. And then after he is crucified, they're each locked up, hiding in their own homes. And then the last point I want to get to is his promise in this world, you will have tribulation. I want to define that because that is a, uh, that's definitely an advanced word. Um, Maybe if you're, if you're a younger part of my audience or, uh, words haven't been your thing. Uh, Tribulation might be one of those words that you've heard a lot, but you don't know exactly what it means. So I'm going to simplify it. Tribulation means a great suffering or a great trouble. It means you're really going through a lot and it hurts and it stings and it makes you sad. So what I want to get at with Jesus's words here is that this is a promise to his disciples, to his followers. In this world, you will have tribulation. So we shouldn't be surprised when when we suffer. We've been warned. And there's this reality that becoming a Christian doesn't make your life easier. It's not a magic fix to all of your problems. And, And unfortunately, this is a popular recruitment strategy. There are a lot of of pastors and preachers and, and, and Christians that will say, oh, if you just turn your life over to Christ, your bills will get paid and and your life will go easy and and you won't have any suffering. And and it's something called theologically, and I know I promise not to use theological words, but this one gets thrown around a lot, so I want to equip you to, to know what it is when you hear it. And that is, it, it's called the prosperity gospel. And and the reality is this whole idea of the prosperity gospel is just not true. Right here, Jesus is promising that his followers will suffer. And if you go to the book of Revelation, the, the followers of Christ are singled out several times for suffering that is above and beyond a lot of what our counterparts uh, outside the faith will will face on this earth. So the reality of this is that not only is suffering a reality, it is our reality as Christians. Christ is promising we will undergo suffering, that we will face all of these things. But the gospel is there's a promise here that the Father goes with us, that we are not alone. Um, and that we have peace in the midst of our sufferings. And you may say, well, what is that peace? Where does that peace come from? And I want to drive us into the epistle with that. And I want to look at 2 Corinthians, starting at the 4th chapter. Um, Verse 13 says, Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory, 
beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to be put on our heavenly dwelling. And I, I'm going to approach this Bible passage a little differently than I usually do. Because I, I have a sermon that I preached over a year ago at this point um, on this text. I, it was the first sermon I ever wrote, actually. And I preached it at my home congregation in Warner Robins, Georgia. And I think it is really appropriate. So my apologies, I, but I'm, I'm going to read through it to you um, with, with maybe some editorial comments in, in the midst of it. But this is, this is the kind of stuff we're talking about. So we're going to go through this. As some of y'all may know, I, I hosted a radio stit show at Vanderbilt. One episode, we discussed different ways that puppies can solve real-world problems. Our, our explanations got increasingly far-fetched as we tried to defend the idea that no problem could not be solved with puppies. For example, one problem was suggested uh, that our studio was burning down, and the solution was a giant puppy drooling on the fire. We all laughed at this solution, but... Here comes my connection, is that as Christians, we sometimes also go to extremes to seek solutions for the suffering in our lives when the world is rough. You see, as Christians, we like sunshine and rainbows. Now, let me clarify, because some of you guys do know me too well. I'm not necessarily saying Christians are optimists. What I'm saying is that we like to say that good will come out of everything. Like if someone loses their job, a response is something like, when one door closes, another door opens. Now, that isn't necessarily wrong, but I think it's coming from a skewed perspective. For example, I couldn't say to a child who just lost their parent that everything was going to work out for them in the end. I couldn't say to a parent who just lost their child that they're going to be better off for it. And I can't tell a friend who's just been diagnosed with cancer that it's going to work out for their benefit. I mean, looking just beyond our circles, in America, there's a lot of tragedy and suffering right now. And in the midst of this coronavirus, I don't know that I can tell someone who, whose business might not survive, who's lost their job, who's lost a family member, who is sick and suffering. I can't tell them necessarily that it's going to be for their good. You see, Christians like to put the best possible spin on things, but sometimes it's really hard to see a benefit to the suffering. Now, the, the world didn't just start being rough in modern day America, in the modern day world. In fact, this world has been rough for a long, long time. And that's where we start to get to our text for today. This passage is wrapped in suffering. It's written by Paul. Now, for those of you who are unaware, when Paul was called into ministry, he was blinded and he didn't eat for three days because he was, he was rebuked by God himself in Acts 9. And after Paul converted to serving God and started living as a believer, the Jews plotted to kill him in Damascus and then in Jerusalem. Uh, persecution was stirred up against him in driving him out of Antioch. And later, he stoned and left for dead. Paul understood suffering intimately. Now, Paul was writing to the Corinthians in this passage, specifically the Christians in Corinth, and the, the government didn't like them because as Christians they started all sorts of controversy. Uh, the Gentiles didn't like them because they had disturbed local pagan traditions. The Jews didn't like them because of their faith in Christ. In fact, in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he was rebuking them for, for so many things. Um, and on top of that, they lived in a time where corruption and oppression were commonplace. You see, both Paul, the author, and Corinthians, the original audience of this text, knew suffering. They knew that this world was rough. So we get to this passage where, where Paul is talking about suffering that I read earlier. Um, he talks about our earthly bodies 
in the passage right before this being frail and weak. And he talks about not keeping our treasures in jars of clay because they're not going to amount to anything. These are not comforting words. They're just describing the suffering in the world. But that's not where Paul finishes. He continues to talk about the good that will come out of it, saying in verses 16 and 17, We don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Now, I know some of you are thinking right now, wait, Josh, you you told us earlier that this isn't quite the way we should be looking at things. And you'd be right. I did say that. I said that at the beginning of this sermon. But the good is that, that Paul is talking about is coming from a different perspective. You see, because in our text, Paul is looking at an eternal perspective for the good that comes from suffering because of Christ's sacrifice for us. Not that your car being wrecked is an opportunity for God to provide you a nicer car. He's telling the Corinthians in the midst of their suffering, regardless of their bodies failing and having struggles with physical wealth and poverty, regardless of all that, that they should keep their eyes fixed on their heavenly future offered through Christ. Even if life here on earth is bad and then goes from bad to worse. And in the gospel, we see this over and over again. In Mark 8, 33, Jesus implores his hearers to have in mind the things of, of God instead of the things of man. And in Matthew 6, he encourages his followers to store up treasures in heaven rather than on earth. And in Matthew 10, he assures his followers to not fear because God will take care of them. You see, God through Paul in Corinthians is reminding us to keep our eyes up and fixed on Jesus. Understanding those lessons, Paul is saying, brothers in Corinth, once we get to that finish line, once we get to heaven, it's going to be incredible. Paul's saying, brothers in Corinth, our heavenly home and our heavenly bodies are never going to fade. Their glory is never going to fade. You see, this world is rough, but Paul is painting a picture for the Corinthians of a future world that isn't. This world is rough, but the future world isn't. And that's incredible. But that message is the Corinthians, is to the Corinthians, and I want to bring that home to you and me before I close. And I want to connect the overwhelming similarities be, between the Christians so long ago and us, because it's a bit of a jump and we, we deal with different things now. But first I want to stop by Luther. As we're going in this timeline, the Corinthians were, were thousands of years ago. Luther was hundreds of years ago. And he had this idea about suffering. He said that suffering was actually one of the devil's most self-defeating tactics. And here's what he meant by that. He meant that when we suffer, we're given an opportunity to, to seek out or to go into meditation on scripture. Because the natural response to suffering that we've talked about this entire podcast is why. And for a Christian, the natural response to, to answer questions like that is to look to scripture. And Luther then suggested that that meditation on scripture leads us even closer to God because it leads us into prayer. Because even in the midst of scripture, we may not have a perfectly clear understanding of why we're suffering. So we talk to God about it. Now, now sometimes when we're led into meditation on the word of God and, and prayer, suffering will continue to increase. Because the devil's going to try even harder to take our faith from us. Which again is self-defeating because it leads us back into this cycle. And scripture offers us very similar advice in the face of suffering. In Romans 8.18, we we read that Paul considers the, the sufferings of this present time not worth comparing with the glory that has been revealed to us. I, I have a friend at the seminary, his name is Devin, that likes to explain it like this. Our sufferings are like thorns in our side. But all of those thorns can be woven into a a crown that Christ wore for us. Our suffering has been taken by Christ for us. And I want to give a shout out to Devin Burmeister because he actually 
when I first wrote this sermon, he, he read through it for me. He helped me edit it. He came down to my dorm room in, uh, in the isolation dorm at seminary. Um, and we sat on my couch together and we walked through it and we made a lot of changes. And I think, so shout out to Devin. Thank you for your help. Um, I guess well over a year ago now. Anyway, so as we look at all of this today, we might not be able to tell our friends and our family and our neighbors who are suffering that everything's going to work out for their benefit in this life, in this rough world. But we can offer them comfort. We can receive comfort ourselves by shifting our perspective toward the heavenly world that Jesus won for us. So when, when you're talking to a child who lost a parent, you can say, hey, let's talk about our heavenly father for comfort and then let's pray about it. Let's pray to our God for the comfort that he can bring. You can tell that parent who lost a child, hey, this is a tragedy. But let's look for comfort in what Jesus has done in the world to come and then go and pray with them. I, I, I can't say that they're going to be better off, but I can say God is taking great care of your kid. You can tell that friend who just lost their job, hey, looks, let's look into what scripture says about the tasks God gives and pray about it. You can tell the friend who's been diagnosed with cancer, let's pray to our God of healing. Uh, your best friend going through a breakup, the son or daughter who just failed an exam, your kid scrapes a knee, your friends lost their house. All of this stuff with the coronavirus. People losing their jobs and their businesses and their health and their independence. We can take them with us to God in prayer with confidence that he will give us peace and comfort. And that's pretty incredible because no matter how rough this world is, we can always go to our God in his word and in prayer for comfort and to strengthen our faith. In the words of the psalmist, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. And that's the the message that Paul is talking about. That's the message he has for us today. That this world is rough, but our future one isn't. We have comfort in the world we get to look forward to when we cross that finish line. And that's the end of my, my sermon. So to conclude this podcast, suffering is a reality. And sometimes God is beyond behind that reality, and we can't pretend to understand why. But we do have confidence that he has a reason for it. And as we have faith in God, that's not that doesn't mean that our suffering is going to disappear. In fact, just the opposite. We're promised that we will continue to suffer even though we have faith in God. But what our faith in God does is it gives us a peace and a comfort and a hope because we can look forward and say, no matter how bad our suffering is now, once we get to heaven with God, it's, it's not even going to be worth comparing to how incredible heaven is. So as we close this this podcast and our original question was God is good God is all-powerful why is there suffering the answer is I don't know but I hope that in the midst of this podcast you found some measure of comfort even though we don't know why God is putting us through that suffering and that's what I want to close on yeah we don't know why but we we can have comfort in this that God loves us And we get to look forward to an eternity of glory with him. Please, if this has been helpful to you, we have 15 prior episodes on whatever platform you're listening on. Just to recap, we are on YouTube, we're on Spotify, we're on iTunes, we're on Podbean, and we're on Google Podcasts. Whatever is your preferred medium for listening to podcasts, please subscribe, follow us. um, And I would encourage you especially subscribe to the St. Paul Lutheran Church and School YouTube page there's a lot of material on there and I think a lot of it is really helpful especially in this time where we can't gather as Christians and Bible study and devotion and worship all get harder especially as we go into Monday Thursday and Good Friday and Easter we will be live streaming services for each of those and I I think it's going to be good it's going to be worthwhile so I would especially encourage you subscribe to St. Paul's YouTube page so with that go in peace brothers and sisters and serve the Lord Thanks be to God.